roshni ka karwa this podcast is brought to you by barrier break solutions private limited and score foundation Hi, my name is George Abraham, and welcome to this edition of Iway Conversations. My guest today is from Zimbabwe. He is a cricket commentator and a cricket journalist, Dean Duplessis. Welcome, Dean, and uh, good to have you on the show. Thank you very much, George. It's been a long time, my friend. Very happy to be on your show. So, Dean, um, uh, you've been a passionate cricket lover, and you've been visually impaired. Uh, how did you actually get interested in cricket? I did my schooling in South Africa. Uh, there's a, a school for the blind in in a town called Worcester, beautiful, picturesque little town in Worcester, in the, in just outside Cape Town, and um, South Africa had just been readmitted to the international scene, and, and uh, they went on a very brief tour of India, which included three one-day internationals. and just the sound george of listening and i'm sure you can you can relate to this of listening to 60 or 70000 even more fanatical indian supporters um and if you remember back in 1991 in the early 90s and so on there was a constant bombardment of fireworks that used to go off all the time that's right and and that in, that initially was uh, what got got me captivated you know and somewhere in between all the fireworks and the cheering you could just make out the radio commentator's voice because it, they didn't have the modern technology that they do of today and it was incredible so it was specifically the third one day international india of course having won this series and um south africa was set with in those days was a seemingly impossible total of 287 <laughs> in their 50 overs and uh, south africa yeah. chased it down very nicely you know, kept the vessels right. on peter kirsten and adrian caper scoring all the runs but I, but i i would suggest that what really sealed the deal uh, in terms of getting becoming totally and utterly hooked on cricket would be the 92 world cup and and 29 years later that is still my most favorite world cup i, I suppose partly because it was my first ever world cup that i listened to but the the whole structure and the format of that world cup was brilliant you had nine countries there and every single one of those nine countries actually won a game you know so and there was some ex- exceptionally good cricket played by every one of those countries as well you uh, had the privilege of being interviewed by ravi shastri uh, now ravi shastri is a top notch commentator and today is the coach of the indian uh, cricket team and he also has been uh, quite a celebrated all rounder as far as indian cricket is concerned uh, tell us a little bit about this interview Well my very first meeting was uh, with Ravi was actually in 1998 um it was India touring Zimbabwe and it was the first one day international um at down at Queen Sports Club in Bulawayo Zimbabwe's second largest city and Sachin Tendulkar just blew Zimbabwe out of the park right and i had 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 a few beers and somebody said to me there is ravi shastri so we went to to talk to him so i was a bit brave because you know drinking beer in the sun um certainly gives you a little bit of courage and but it was wonderful talking to him and you know i remember him telling me what a fine player dave houghton was and how to sad that the world never really got to see the best of edo brandes and we spoke about about obviously about indian cricket So that was my first informal meeting with him and then I started to get to know him quite quite extensively because um he would always be the anchor and the host of matches here in Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe had a very busy schedule from 99 up until 2000. You had uh Sri Lanka here for three tests and five one day internationals. Then you had New Zealand here in 2000 and, and Ravi was was very um he well he was he used to do the build up and uh, presentation as well. So I got to know him quite well. 2001 however was the first time that he interviewed me um on two occasions the first was in in the first test match against bulawayo uh, against uh, india in bulawayo which india won by nine wickets but it was an incredibly good test match very nicely contested test um but the interview that really made it for me was the, the second test match at harare sports club that zimbabwe won by four wickets and just the way that ravi 
really took to the idea of of having me on the on as a guest during the tea break and you know him asking me what to, what what total do you think Zimbabwe will be happy with chasing and he he really spoke to me not as you know it wasn't the usual you are blind and and how do you enjoy cricket when you can't see it there was none of that it was it was a real one cricket lover to another cricket lover interview and conversation and what happened was uh, he explained to me he said well dean what you can't see but the viewers can see screens is that the flower brothers have actually delayed play to listen to your interview they were in the dressing room and andy and grant actually waited for us to finish um and even the indian players they were out in the field but they weren't you know they weren't annoyed with the fact that the flower brothers were were waiting it was an incredible experience you know it it really was and the way that ravi described it to me was was fantastic and then of course because of that interview with Ravi and because it was a, a very down to earth what i like to call human interview that then led to neil manthorp who's a very good friend of mine and mentor um he 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 recognized me because he came up for the triangular series in 2001 which involved zimbabwe india and the west indies and he and a bunch of guys were doing radio commentary but on the internet on crick info Neil then recognized me from this interview that Ravi had with me and um that's how he lured me into the radio commentary box to come and do a little bit of uh, yeah, work in the radio commentary box which obviously was very special. Uh this is fascinating before I get to that question I also need to kind of tell you that uh, Indians will always remember Edo Brandis uh and the 1983 World Cup because he had India down to 18 for 5. and then it was that magical innings from kapil dev that kind of bailed india out i don't know whether you remember that but um, very much so yeah <laughs> that was an incredible uh, performance it uh, was, it was uh, you know and what 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 that innings of kapil dev that made it so special was that he he never he never changed the tempo of the game you know it, you would you would assume that he would have smashed one six after another which he did towards the end but it was such a well measured innings george that um you know uh, talking to dave hart and, and andy pycroft about it you know the zimbabweans didn't do much wrong kapil was just so brilliant in the way that he that he he i suppose got the innings together and held it together but it wasn't a flamboyant aggressive adam gilchrist type um innings that you would expect you know he he, he put the bad ball away and he rotated the strike and he was unbelievably good on that day it's, it's fascinating to know that um, you being totally blind were actually able to give ball by ball cricket commentary sitting in the commentary box uh there would be thousands of cricket fans in india who would love to be in your shoes why don't you talk us through how you actually managed to give that commentary being relevant being honest to the game yeah you know um well <sighs> All, all, all i can say is that to all those hundred those millions of of cricket fans who are blind or partially sighted or visually impaired whichever term you you like to use but f- for someone like me who's totally blind you you must you must never stop believing honestly if if you do feel that you want to do that never stop believing um and i'm sure that they are just as capable if not more capable than me it's just that i've been very blessed living in zimbabwe a small country that i was given an opportunity you know so in terms of of television so i i got involved with radio in 2001 and then i got involved with television in 2003 um it it was a huge uh it it was a big thing for me to be perfect because the directors and producers had been i suppose toying with the idea for for two years you know but they, nobody was quite brave enough to do it and then mike hazman actually said you know let's actually stop talking about this because we've spoken about it on so many occasions let's stop talking about it let's do it and it was the second one day international between the west indies and zimbabwe which zimbabwe won by five wickets and i mean because i'd actually been in the television commentary box for so long you know you you get to to listen to how things happen around you so it wasn't such a big transition to be perfectly honest with you you know um it's a bit like someone like like Michael Hussey who had scored so many runs at first class level that by the time he got to play test match cricket he knew his game so well that it actually wasn't such a big it wasn't such a big step you know Davy Houghton as well had a similar thing from a Zimbabwean perspective so how do i do it um 
Well, the stump microphones obviously is what works for me. So whether I'm listening to television or whether I'm commentating, the stump mics are very, very important. And I mean, they don't do anything special. The directors and producers don't do anything special for me. I don't get any special treatment. The only time that maybe I do get a bit of help is if a graphic appears on your television screen that obviously I can't see. You know, that may be something that says this fourth wicket partnership of 221 between Paul Sterling and Andrew Balboni uh, against Zimbabwe beats the previous best, which was set by Kevin O'Brien and, you know, whoever the, the other batsman would have been. Um, and then I, I can say that, but I mean, obviously I can't read it, but... You know, the stump mics are, are very important because obviously you can tell when the ball hits the stumps. So you you can hear that sound when somebody's being bowled and the the edges that the batsmen get through to the stumps or the wicket keepers are, are very useful as well. And even the reverse sweep, and I'm sure that many blind people can relate to this. Lots of times when a reverse sweep is played, you will hear the bat sort of scrape, hit the ground, you know, um, as the reverse sweep is is played and lots of times i that's how i know ah there's the reverse sweep because that scraping sound that the bat makes when it when it hits the ground right so uh, how do you how do you kind of know that um, uh, in fact is that important on television uh, is it important for you to know whether the bowler is bowling around the uh, around the wicket or over the wicket uh, whether the ball was pitched in the outside in the corridor of uncertainty is that important on, in television cricket? Because uh, television commentary does not really include those kind of details generally, I've noticed. Uh, that comes yes. into play mainly That's when correct. it is radio. Yeah, when it is radio, yes, absolutely. But I mean, you know, to be to be honest with you, there you rely on the umpire because he will say, change your bowling, right arm around or, you know, right arm over. I mean, there's, there's, I don't think that there's any way possible that, that those stump mics, that the angles will change so that you can hear when the bowler is bowling over the wicket or around the wicket. But having said that, I I will pay a bit more attention and, and see if I can maybe do that. Because, I mean, you can I can tell who the bowlers are lots of times by it's just the way that they land with their feet at the crease. You know, certain bowlers have their little um, noises that they make, little grunts and, and, you know, the way that they drag their feet and... Obviously, a spinner, you can tell when it's a spinner because not, not only because the wicketkeeper stands up to him, but I mean, you can hear from the time it leaves the, the hand of the bowler to when it hits the, the, the stumps or the pad or the, the bat. You know, Shane Warne obviously being a leg spinner and, and, and because he used to put so much effort into his bowling. So a lot of upper body strength Shane Warne used to use, very strong in the shoulders and strong wrist as well. And so he'd give quite a bit of a grunt. And sometimes, depending on how, how good the stump mics were, when Shane Warne bowled a certain delivery, you would actually hear his fingers sort of click like right, that right. Um, as, he, as he released the delivery. It was incredible, unbelievable to, to listen to that you could actually hear the fingers click like that. But it wasn't all the time. It, it, it didn't happen all the time. It was, I'm sure, to certain deliveries that he bowled where you would hear that click of the fingers. If you know of anyone with vision impairment who needs guidance on living life with blindness, please share the IWA National Toll Free Helpline number 1800532046. The number is 1800532046. So did you ever feel that uh, knowing what's going on in the middle was more important than your own personal knowledge of the game and the history of the game? Do you think you could carry the day just by your knowledge, sheer knowledge of the game? I think a lot of it. Um, I think a lot of it certainly did uh, did uh, rely and depend very much on knowledge because you know ninety percent of the of the broadcasting in, industry are can be very hypocritical and two-faced so they love the story they want to get the story but then when it actually comes down to the business end of the deal um, they are not necessarily keen to utilize you to the maximum because one you've never played test cricket before which obviously is such a big thing and and two you've, you've never seen a cricket ball in your life 
So they'll be the first ones to come knocking on the door because they like the story and it'll be good for their, you know, for their image. But when it comes down to using you, then they're quite reluctant. So if you make a mistake, you know that they will say, this is exactly why we didn't want to use you in the first place. So knowledge of the game is very, very important. Being as alert as you possibly can um, is is of the utmost importance in, in order to be successful. Um, and so what, what I often find is that when you get to the end of a day, which obviously sometimes involves television work, radio work, not so much writing anymore, but there was a time when it involved TV work, radio work, writing, and the odd um, analysis that you'd have to give. You know, it. Um, you, I, I was exhausted, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of the sighted commentators, they can rely on monitors and all sorts of things where they get their information from, whereas predominantly I have to use my memory um, and remember. So I, I found that I was, yeah, I was very tired at the end of the day, but it's a nice type of tired because you know that it's an achievement and an accomplishment and you did the job to the very best of your ability. So in your career as a commentator, who are the big names uh, that you've actually commentated with? Um, well, Robin Jackman, the late Robin Jackman, the late Tony Cozier. Uh, wonderful to, very privileged to share the commentary box with them. And, you know, the sad thing is I don't have any footage of that. I, I was so caught up in the moment and so honoured that I was going to be working with them that I never, ever thought to ask the, the crew, would you guys m mind recording this so that, you know, I can use it or listen to it or reminisce. And I, I don't have any of that. But, I mean, I've worked with Robin Jackman, Tony Cozier, uh, Pami and Bangwa pretty extensively. Uh, Mike Hazeman, uh, myself and Bruce Yardley, the late Bruce Yardley. We made a little bit of history by of our own by uh, in 2004 when England toured Zimbabwe. The last time England toured Zimbabwe for a couple of one-day games, right? Before they headed down to South Africa, we we made a we made a bit of history all by ourselves because you know Bruce Yardley lost an eye. Um, when he was in the Caribbean, he unfortunately he lost an eye when he was coaching Sri Lanka. Right. And of course, I have no eyes. So we, 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 we became the first commentators in the world to commentate with only one eye working between the two of us. So Dean, uh, you have a, a cricket podcast. And uh, so I would be interested in knowing uh, what exactly do you talk about in this podcast? And I would also like to know what's the kind of technology you, you use to actually uh, work on this podcast independently. Um, would you like to share? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, the name of my podcast is called Dean at Stumps. Uh, and that at, it's not the at sign, it's the word at. So Dean at Stumps. And, and it's available on all your major podcast feeds, you know, your Spotify, Apple podcast, um, all, all the big one, all the big hosts um, have this particular podcast. And, um, basically, it's very similar to what you're doing now. The, the podcast predominantly focuses on on players' careers, and and you know, be they former players or even current players, if you're lucky enough. And we just have a bit of a chat about uh, you know about the what they hope to achieve or what they did achieve. And and last year was uh, was a very good year for me. Honestly, I was blessed uh, because I was able to interview David Gower. Michael Holding, Sean Pollock, Kumar Sangakara, uh, the late Dean Jones, which was also an incredible interview to listen to. He really was fantastic with Dean Jones. Um, A.B. de Villiers, Graham Hick, one of my teenage heroes. Graham doesn't normally, he's a very reluctant interviewee, but um, he was just a superstar and a champion on this day. He, he told me whatever I wanted to know. He just opened up his heart and spoke so nicely. You know, so and the list is endless. Those are just a couple of names that I've uh, that I've thought of off the top of my head. In terms of technology, it's it's very basic, um, to be honest with you, George. Um, I have, I have a Bose docking station, and what I do is I connect my iPhone to my Bose docking station, <laughs> and then I I initiate a call either via WhatsApp or FaceTime or, you know, whichever um, Zoom, and and then. I have my iPad, and the iPad has a microphone, um, an external microphone that is very good quality. And I use a recording app called Backpack Studio. 
And then I upload the recording from Backpack Studio into something which is called Anchor. And Anchor is then the host which provides the various podcast feeds. So I don't have anything particularly fancy, to be very honest with you. Um, I don't have any editing equipment either. And how I've got away with that for so long, I do not know. But I've been very blessed in that department. That um, So that's pretty much how... How I do it, very primitive, very simple, but it works. And, and that's the most important thing. Wonderful. Um, and, and you also are a, a cricket journalist or a cricket writer. What's the kind of writing you do? Uh, yes, I actually haven't written an article for a good five or six years, to be honest with you. I used to write for one of our newspapers. That was basically just a, a column uh, where I would give my, my, my thoughts and opinions as to, you know, the progression or um, instability, which has bedeviled and plagued Zimbabwe cricket for the last 17 years. Um, you know, it's a scenario where Zimbabwe cricket take one step forward and five or six steps back, unfortunately. Um, and I'd write about that, so uh, I, which would then make it to the to the newspapers. But I haven't done that for a while, um, purely because there, you know, the financial situation in Zimbabwe is so difficult at the moment that. Nobody is prepared to pay you for the columns that you write. And, and if I want to make this a living, I need to be a little, I need to look after myself as well. You know, I mean, to be very honest with you, a lot of people have been very kind to me. Um, and, and I'll always be very appreciative of that. But if I need to make this, if I want to make this a living, I need to earn an income, as you can appreciate. So I don't mind um, being interviewed by radio and television stations and, and so on. And people who like to obviously chat to me and about me, that's fine. But when it does come down to doing actual work for somebody, then you do need to draw the line and say, look, I'm happy to, I'm happy to write your columns and, and so on and so forth, but you do need to try and help me uh, from a financial perspective. You know, otherwise, how do I pay the bills at the end of the month, just like anybody else? That's a fair call. Um, so uh, let's get down to uh, another very basic question, uh, Dean. Um, You've lost your eyesight from very early in childhood, right? And uh, what's the story behind it? And how did you manage your early days? What was the school days like? And um, talk us through that. Yeah, I was actually born blind, thank goodness. So um, I've never, ever had any eyesight, ever. Not for any period of my 44 years. Uh, born blind, and which I'm very grateful for. I, I don't know if I would have coped even if I did have some form of eyesight and, and if I then lost it. So I've never had the ability to even distinguish light from dark. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. I really am. You know, so, so school, well, school is school. You know, you, it, had, it had its ups, but it certainly had its downs as well. I mean, obviously, I became a boarder, a weekly boarder at the age of three years old. And that was to prepare me for going to school in South Africa at the age of six, which was very difficult. But I can assure you that the people who actually bear the brunt more are your parents. Right. Your parents who send their, their, their kid away. You know, kids are quite tough and they're quite resourceful and they find a way to survive. But but it's the parents who really take huge amounts of strain. And um, my mom and dad did what they knew was right at the time. You know, in the 1980s, you can appreciate uh, there was no online schooling and um, we didn't have enough money to facilitate a private tutor. But it's not only that. You, you know, you need to be amongst people of your own kind as well so that you can learn survival skills and, and so on as well. You know, so although I have to be honest with you, there was a lot that I didn't like about school in South Africa. The only thing that I can say is that um, had I not gone to school in South Africa, I probably wouldn't have discovered cricket. Um, because of the fact that the cricket was always, there was always ball by ball commentary on radio, which which was just amazing uh, for me to listen to. So yeah, that that's pretty much how I um, perceived school. But I wasn't too disappointed when on the 16th of November I boarded an airplane in 1994. I boarded an airplane for the last time and came back to my my home country. I was very very happy. Uh yeah, our, our listeners in India would be very keen to know a little bit more about 
uh, the role your parents and your siblings uh, have played, how did they interact with you, how did they engage with you, and uh, uh, what was their kind of um, approach to your growing up days? Yeah, um, I was very blessed that my family is a very close and loving family and very supportive of what I do as well. So growing up, I had an older brother, Gary, who himself was a, a very good cricketer, very, very good swing bowler. Um, and he played provincial cricket and club cricket. Um, my dad, obviously loving the game as much as he, as he did as well, also was a very big influence. But, you know, we we were, um, my, my family weren't the type who believed in sheltering me. Um, you know, if there was something that was a bit too dangerous, they would obviously say, you can't do that. Or, But predominantly, I mean, you know, I had a very happy childhood in the sense that I got to, we would go and visit my grandparents on the farm and you'd be on the back of a, of a pickup truck and, you know, um, driving through the, driving through the bush and, and doing all sorts of crazy things on very fast boats and motorcycles as well. I, um, I have a cousin who used to take me on, on various motorcycles at ridiculously high speeds. You know, I'm talking in the region of 270, 280 kilometers an hour. And um, um, we would do all these crazy things, you know, and people would say, well, without asking my mother, how do you allow your son to be going on, on these very fast motorcycles and jumping out of airplanes and, and you know, stuff like that? And she would say, well, the, the, to be honest with you, the, the less I know about it, the happier I'll be. I know that he's with his cousin and I know that they're going to be doing ridiculous speeds and, but I don't want to know about it. So if you people do see uh, Dean and his cousin doing that, just don't say a word because <laughs> it'll give me sleepless nights. Nice. Um, you know, and my brother, my brother was incredible with me as well. We would go tree climbing and, um, you know, we would pretend to be, we would have our epic WrestleMania WWE WrestleMania fights as well, which were spectacular. So he was always a wrestler by the name of the Ultimate Warrior. And I was a guy called Superfly Jimmy Snooker. And it was wonderful, you know. So we used to, I grew up very in a very physical environment, um, if I can put it that way, which was wonderful. To support our work with the blind and visually impaired, you can visit the donate page on our website www.scorefoundation.org.in Please note www.scorefoundation.org.in You are uh, married to a, a professional chef. Uh, we would be interested in knowing how you met and how is it like to be married and uh, as being a blind uh, spouse, uh, what are the challenges you face? Uh, the only challenges that we faced um, in terms of being married is that I, you know, I, I, I do like to have a bit of a good time. I like my music. I like to be around the barbecue. Um, I like to, <laughs> I like to have a few cold beverages. And she's a bit more reserved. So lots of times when she desperately wants to come home and go to sleep, I still want to be with the party. You know, that's the only challenge that we have. But, you know, I think like any good husband and wife, we, we found a way to negate that, hopefully. Um, and we met at a barbecue. Um, a neutral friend of ours was having a barbecue. And we met there and, you know, two very different people. She, in those years, was very reserved. She just basically, you know, would have a barbecue, we would go to a party and, and not really get involved with, with all the crazy things that I do. But slowly but surely, she came out of a shell. So we met in April of 2012. And by May 2013, we were married. You know, so it was a, a pretty quick, uh, a swift rise, really, from, from being friends to dating each other to being husband and wife. And um, I can safely assure you that since we've been married, I've probably gained, I would suggest to you, 15, 15 kilograms, maybe even a bit more, um, thanks to her good cooking. 
Though I've got to be honest with you, I'm more of a savory. I don't like vegetables, by the way, George. I'm a real meat man, um, a carnivore, really. <laughs> so she always has to make sure that um, I don't have too much vegetables on my plate. Predominantly meat and potato, and I'm happy. Um, I'm not really into all the cakes and biscuits and things that, that she bakes. But like I said, I'm more of a meat, meat and potato sort of a guy. What do you do professionally? Where does the money come in for the food on the table? Right. Well, um, basically, I work at a radio station, which is uh, part of the national broadcaster at Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. Um, so I have a weekly cricket show, which has the same name as my podcast, Dean at Stumps. Um, and then I also have a music show, which I, which I co-host every Saturday, um, which is a great deal of fun because I do love my music as well. Uh, and then in between that, I just do cricket updates for the radio station. So I'm very fortunate that I actually work at a radio station. I remember a couple of years ago when you and I spoke, I used to work at a transport company on their very busy switchboard. Uh, that, thankfully, is something of the past. I, I don't think I could, I could ever see myself going back to customer care and switchboards and nasty customers. You know, to be on, on radio is something that I wanted to do from the age of four years old. And now I guess I'm, I'm, I'm living a dream. The Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, I can assure you, is not the nicest of places to be working at. Um, it's a very cold and hostile environment and, and the equipment that they use is, is antiquated. But the joy of being able to broadcast your various shows to the entire population of Zimbabwe gives me huge amounts of, of satisfaction and, and I think supersedes the frustrations of, uh, of the current setup that we have. Well, Dean, thank you very much for speaking to us uh, and talking to us about your cricketing exploits and your uh, uh, various experiences of life. It's been wonderful and uh, wish you all the very best. Thank you very much indeed, George, and wishing you and your show nothing but the very best and, and success. I this podcast was brought to you by Barrier Break Solutions Private Limited and Score Foundation. Yeah, Roshani, 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 Roshani,